Hello, I'm Kelly Kuo, one of the four finalists in the Olympia Symphony Orchestra's music director search. Over the past two pandemic years, one of the things I've been able to do to reach audiences in advance of performances is put together videos that serve as a quick introduction to the works and soloists on a particular program. That way you get to see my face for at least a few minutes rather than the backside that you'll be seeing for most of the performance itself. Speaking of faces, the Brazilian artist Hidro Leidial has recently been using artificial intelligence to give us an idea of what well-known people from the past might look like today as a younger version of themselves. This is his portrait on Instagram of a modern-looking young Beethoven. Fascinating, right? Now, Beethoven is a pretty universally known name, even among those who don't have any interest in orchestral music. I'd venture to guess that a good number of the world's population knows that he composed this. And this. Also likely that many people even know that he started to lose his hearing early on in life, and he contemplated suicide even as he continued to compose music that he would never be able to hear except in his own mind. But how many people think of Beethoven as a theatrical composer? Yes, he wrote one opera, Fidelio, but he is largely remembered for his symphonies, concertos, piano sonatas, and chamber music. When he was working on his second symphony in 1800, Beethoven received an unexpected commission for a ballet designed by Salvatore Viganò, a famous ballet master who was to choreograph a new piece for the Viennese imperial court based upon the myth of Prometheus, but reinterpreted in the spirit of the Enlightenment. Beethoven was thrilled about this important opportunity as he was still new to Vienna and was trying to establish his reputation with the court. The Prometheus of myth steals fire from the gods, gives it to humans, and then is punished by Zeus, who chains him to a rock, where a vulture visits him daily to eat his ever-regenerating liver. Yikes! Perhaps a little too extreme for audiences of the day, Prometheus the Ballet instead has him use the stolen fire to bring statues of a man and woman to life, who are then enlightened by various characters in knowledge and art. There is some question among musicologists as to the number of performances the creatures of Prometheus received after its premiere in March of 1801. The number ranges anywhere from 23 to 33, which was only a modest success by ballet standards. But whatever the number, it was still the largest number of public performances of any of Beethoven's works in his lifetime. However, the ballet eventually became obscure, and other than a handful of recent revivals, it is only Beethoven's traditional overture that has remained in the repertoire as a frequently performed concert piece. The overture opens with a slow introduction reminiscent of the composer's first symphony, but quickly turns to this energetic burst of fast notes before an exhilarating ending, all in under five minutes. After the Prometheus Overture, you'll hear a charming arrangement for viola and string orchestra of Schubert's tuneful arpeggioni sonata by the composer Dobrinka Tabakova. Schubert composed the sonata in 1824 at the age of 27, just four years before his premature death from syphilis. However, it was not published until 47 years later in 1871, when the publishing company Bright von Hertel was compiling Schubert's complete works. The arpeggione was a type of large fretted guitar with six strings that was held between the legs and played with a bow like a cello. It was invented the year before Schubert wrote his sonata for the instrument and was in vogue for only about 10 years before it became extinct, likely because the instrument couldn't be played aggressively, else the excessive bow pressure would play two strings instead of one. It was likely this characteristic that contributed to its short life, as its gentle tone couldn't compete against the violin family instruments that were getting increasingly louder to project in newer and bigger halls. Schubert is probably best known today for his leader, and this sonata showcases poignant melodies that sound effortlessly beautiful when performed at their best. 
As one artist has cautioned, however, it's easy to do too much and it's easy to do too little. Like much of his leader, the mood changes rapidly from sad, nostalgic, and hopeful to a sudden moment of fleeting passion. Some may immediately think of the essential Viennese quality of smiling through tears. Let's listen to the beginning of the first movement played on an actual arpeggione accompanied by a forte piano, a keyboard similar to the type Schubert had in his own home. You can almost feel the fragility in the music, and it's easy to hear why this intimate piece is an all-time favorite of chamber music lovers. While the arpeggioni instrument still exists, there are very few of them, and Schubert's sonata is mostly played today in transcriptions for viola or cello, such as the one you'll hear on our program. The technical acrobatics to cover on four strings what was composed for six strings has been challenging musical professionals and amateurs alike for over 150 years. But our soloist tonight is up to the task. Amber Archibald Svechik was born and raised in Houston, Texas, to parents from the Dominican Republic and Panama. As a soloist, she counts among her highlights performances at the Gavant House with the Leipzig Academic Orchestra and those with the Seattle Symphony. In demand as well as a teacher and pedagogue, Dr. Archibald has held faculty positions at Seattle Pacific University and the Los Angeles Philharmonic's National Take a Stand Festival, and we are looking forward to collaborating with her in this arrangement of Schubert's masterpiece. Born and raised in Finland to parents of Swedish heritage, Jean Sibelius displayed musical gifts at an early age, studying both piano and violin, but favoring the latter. He had perfect pitch, once having observed that the hammering outdoors by a repairman was hitting a G that was a quarter tone out of tune. He, like the composer Messian, also had synesthesia, the phenomenon that allows one to experience colors musically. As a young boy, he tried to play the colors he saw in the parlor carpet, his favorite being a clear green that he said was, quote, somewhere between D and E flat. Sibelius is arguably Finland's greatest composer, and his music is often connected with a sense of national identity for the country as it engaged in a struggle for survival as an autonomous duchy in the Russian Empire as the 19th century transitioned into the 20th. His first symphony was completed when the composer was 34 years old in 1899, the same year that Tsar Nicholas issued his February Manifesto, which stripped the Finnish parliament of many of its powers. In the ultimate display of passive resistance, the Finns chose a most artistic weapon, music. Though Sibelius wasn't a political man, he was a supporter of the Finnish resistance. He was more than happy to write protest music that would essentially serve as a rallying cry for his country's residents during this politically explosive situation. This included his ambitious first symphony, which Sibelius conducted a premiere of himself in Helsinki in April of 1899, then went on tour to other parts of Scandinavia and Germany. Finally, it was performed at the World Exposition in Paris in 1900, essentially giving proof to the world that Finland had a unique culture that was worth fighting for. Though it would turn out to be one of the greatest first symphonies ever composed, the work didn't altogether please Sibelius at first. Under the cloud of the death of his third daughter from an illness, he ended up revising it before the tour to make it the work that eventually provided the composer his international breakthrough. Given that Richard Strauss was writing tone poems and Debussy had basically declared the symphony a dead form, it was somewhat rebellious for Sibelius to believe that the classical four movement symphony structure had not yet been exhausted and that there existed more to be said with the manipulation of musical material without a direct association with the storyline. Listen to the unique opening of the first movement in which a timpani roll, barely audible, accompanies a clarinet's folk-like melody, both mournful and yearning.
Then suddenly the icy glint of strings appear with a passionate theme of defiance, which is soon echoed by the full orchestra with the roar of brass that would become a trademark sound of Sibelius. Though there's clearly a remarkable new orchestral sound and intensity unique to Sibelius, the second movement of this symphony contains much of the spirit of Tchaikovsky, the Russian composer that Sibelius admired, and about whom he said, there is much in that man that I recognize in myself. Listen to the romantic rocking melody that forms the core of this movement. In the third movement, Sibelius conjures up the energetic scherzos that are often associated with Anton Bruckner, filling it with exciting cross rhythms and impetuous playfulness. But it is in a finale, subtitled Like a Fantasy, that Sibelius demonstrates that he is doing something very out of the box. The fantasy takes the lonely clarinet melody that opened the first movement and transforms it into this terrifying icy Nordic blast. This theme is developed through a wild dance until we get to the composer's epic surprise ending. Two pizzicato chords that simply take your breath away and leave you stunned. Now, Sibelius's reputation has gone up and down over the years due to the competing forces of atonal music, which dominated the middle of the 20th century. Even the composer acknowledged this, saying, for a time maybe, little notice will be taken of my works, but I believe that I can hope that they will not be completely forgotten. And if there's anything that has been proven correct over time, it's that when the pendulum swings one way, it will return the other way. Harmony and discord, light and darkness, war and peace. It's Sibelius' time once again, and I hope you enjoy the journey with us. It's truly a privilege to be making music for you, and we are so looking forward to sharing our joy with you from the stage. Thank you for watching.